meeting to order for the Board of Trustees for Tuesday, September 21st. Um, I'm gonna do a housekeeping note first. We have a link up to provide a public comment. It's available on the agenda. It's uh, published on the VSC website and there's a link posted in the chat. And if you have any questions, you can contact Jen Poirier and she can help you with that. Um, we have the second thing on the agenda is um, a resolution honoring trustee Linda Elm, who is retiring. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's already former trustee. Well, yes. So, and we have um, a resolution honoring her that we will ask Karen Luno to, uh, to read. Are you ready and you can hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Hello, Linda. Hello, it's Karen. Such a pleasure to see you. I'm sorry we missed yesterday. Um, this is truly a, a distinct pleasure and honor um, to, to read this resolution. One of the nice things about serving on the Board of Trustees that one doesn't expect are the good friendships, the lifelong friendships that one makes on service on any board. And um, Linda, Linda and I have come to be very good friends and I enjoy her and respect her. And it's a real privilege. And I do want to point out, um, as a testament to Linda's dedication, her term was up in March. And due to the unusual and challenging times, despite the fact that Linda had uh, was faced with um, challenges of her own in her personal life, uh, above and beyond, she chose to continue service. Um, to help the VSC and, and to continue service to the people of the state of Vermont. So um, I think that needs to be noted as well. Um, I would like to read the resolution honoring the service of Linda Milne. Whereas Linda Milne has served on the Vermont State College's Board of Trustees for a total of 17 years from 2004 to 2021 having been appointed twice by Governor Jim Douglas and subsequently by Governor Peter Shumlin. And whereas during her tenure, Linda dutifully served on finance and facilities, audit and nominating committees, serving as chair of the audit committee and chair of the nominating committee. And whereas during her tenure, Linda was elected secretary and later treasurer of the Vermont State College's Board of Trustees thereby serving with distinction on the executive committee. And whereas during her tenure, Linda was a member of various presidential search committees. And whereas Linda has completed a distinguished professional career spanning 40 years of experience in accounting, auditing, lobbying, and public relations. And whereas Linda's professional affiliations include the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, Vermont Society of Certified Public Accountants and the Institute of Internal Auditors, Green Mountain Chapter. And whereas Linda is a proud member of the Vermont Rot Rotary and whereas the Vermont State College's Board of Trustees and the VSC system have been enriched by the totality of Linda's professional accomplishments and community participation, and whereas the Vermont State College's Board of Trustees have enjoyed Linda's wit, wisdom, and respected her without fear or favor of any one guidance at committee and board meetings. And whereas Linda has been a passionate and consistent advocate for affordable higher education, therefore be it resolved, the Vermont State College's Board of Trustees expresses its sincere appreciation to Linda Milne for the benefit she has brought to the state of Vermont, to its colleges and universities, to its hundreds of faculty and staff, and most important to the thousands of students. Linda, we are honored to have served with you and we wish you the very best. Okay, we have a motion on the table. Uh, do we have a second? Second from Janet and Barje. Okay, any discussion? I would just like to say, Linda, 
that you have been a valuable member of the board. Uh, you came, when I came on, oh, it must be 10 years ago, you were experienced and seasoned and knew how to ask all the right questions, especially about the financial situations. And having served with you on the audit committee, I've always been amazed and humbled by how much you actually knew about the audit process and the questions you asked our auditors, none of which I understood. <laughs> <laughs> but I do say, um, without you, we would never have had the kind of um, perception of the audits and the things that we needed to know about our financial standing and the, the bad. Nobody understood it the way you did. I also want to say that when I got on the audit committee, you were as chair of the audit committee, you were in charge of the whistleblower <laughs> reports, and you had a few of those at the time, and uh, very professional, very confidential, but very, very uh, prepared to deal with that. And, um, you know, and I know that that was a real asset to the organizations. And, and Getting blanks. So I know we're in good hands, but your experience was just necessary, timeless, and really important. Is there anyone else who'd like to say something to Linda? Janet. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. I really appreciated your honesty uh, during the trustee process, as well as your insight. And, um, you know, I, I think you made the board better while you've been on it and uh, appreciate getting to know you. Anyone else? Yes, Bill. Yeah, likewise, uh, Linda, thank you. Um, your, uh, your thoughtfulness, your directness at times when as necessary, uh, your uh, commitment and uh, to this organization over a long period of time has made a tremendous difference. And I have also appreciated getting to know you personally. So thank you. Jim Maslin. Yeah, mom. Um, seconding all of the above, and I would just add, Linda, don't be a stranger. You know where to find us. Come on by. We'd appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Anyone else? Well, seeing no other discussion, um, all those in favor of the resolution to honor Linda Milne, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? I don't think anyone's opposed. So, Linda, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and, and giving us the chance to honor you. Thank you. May I just say a few words of farewell? Yes, please. Thank you for the kind resolution um, and remarks this morning. I really have enjoyed working with so many of you over the years, and I am delighted to be able to share that feeling with you today. I was looking forward to doing it in uh, person. Mm -hmm. Um, and I and I do miss that opportunity, um, although it may actually be fitting that we're doing this over Zoom since it was through the Vermont State Colleges that I participated in my first Zoom meetings um, and so many other Zoom meetings. Um, and a sure sign that this must be the time to end it is I've used this very same setup here for the last year and a half for any Zoom meetings. This morning, as I came to get set up, the uh, light, the light that I have here to my left to light my face broke. And right now my shade is propped up on my computer and I'm trying not to move too much to make sure that it all fits. So this must be the time. Um, I do wanna acknowledge the help and support I've received over the 17 years that I was on the board. My first two years on the board felt like a very steep learning curve. I had no background in academics, except for the four years that I had spent at a small liberal arts college in the 1970s when I got my BA. I have a financial background as an auditor of governments, so I was always comfortable with the audit report and, the, and, the audit, and working with the auditors. 
It took a year or two because of its complexity for me to feel comfortable with the financial information or to feel like I understood that financial information because it is very, very complex. Admittedly, although I was comfortable with my understanding um, because of the difficult financial situations and situations and sometimes lack of state support and other things the system faced, I wasn't always comfortable with the financial situation of the system as a whole. Um, and fortunately, you're in a good situation to try to be dealing with that now. In learning about education, the opportunities and challenges facing the system, I had support and wise counsel from fellow trustees and um, both past and present, many, some of you are here now. I had a great deal of help from staff and management of the colleges and the chancellor's office. And I had help from students of the system that I knew through friends, family and community involvement or who reached out to me as a uh, trustee. My sincere thanks to all of you who helped me. I often had a lot of fun working and enjoyed myself on the board because I love learning new things. I enjoy discussions of interesting topics with people I agree with, but especially with people I don't necessarily agree with. It's so much more fun, those kind of conversations. And I will miss that engagement. I wanna thank all of you for giving me this opportunity to bring closure to my years of service on the board. You've helped me in making the experience both enjoyable and personally rewarding to me. Thank you. I wish you, the current trustees and staff and students, best wishes on this important effort of restructuring the system that you're engaged in. I have confidence in all of you. And I look forward to watching the system continue to serve the students of Vermont and to provide accessible and affordable education to Vermonters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We wish you Godspeed. Thank you. You, you too, and ditto, really. Thank you. And thank I will you. sign off now again. Thank you. Okay. Well, that was a very pleasant farewell to Linda. We wish her the best. Uh, the second thing on the agenda is the um, approval of the minutes from Jan August 4th. Um, I need a motion for approval of the minutes. Do I see one? Uh, Sue Zeller is a, and I need a second. Uh, Jim Maslin will count as the second. Uh, any discussion, additions, or corrections on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor of accepting the minutes of August 4th, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Um, okay, now we have a presentation by Vision Point Marketing on recommending a new name for the new university, the new combined entity, as it's been called. Um, would the chancellor like to introduce Vision Point? Sure, I would be happy to do that. Um, so we did, we hired an experienced higher education marketing firm, Vision Point Marketing, back in June uh, to conduct extensive audience research and to use the findings of that research to recommend a name and to develop a brand identity for the new institution that will be unifying Castleton University, Northern Vermont University, and Vermont Technical College. After conducting 31 small group listening sessions with students, faculty, staff, leadership, alumni, and community members across the VSC, and a brand perception study with over 3,000 respondents, and a targeted uh, brand workshop with 25 participants from the institutions, and deep dive research into each institution, Vision Point Marketing today is making their recommendation for the name of the new unified institution to the Board of Trustees. Um, I would point out this is really just a first step in a multi-step process that we will be having for establishing the identity and brand of the new institution. There are other critical elements to come, including the mission and vision, the brand identity, the academic program array, and the organizational structure. 
So each of those pieces are currently being developed. And I do want to thank all the many, many people um, across the system that are really working together to collaborate on those pieces. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bruce Ortiz and to Katie Campbell um, to share the results um, and their recommendation of the work that they've been doing for us. All right. Thank you very much, Chancellor Zadatni. I'm going to share my screen here. Don't mind. All right. Please, uh, everyone, let me know just by nodding your head if you're able to see the screen. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for uh, inviting Vision Point to uh, participate uh, in this Board of Trustees meeting and uh, for inviting us to witness the recognition, remarks, and resolution in honor of your fellow trustee, uh, Linda Mills. Uh, it was really great to experience. So thank you very much. Um, as Chancellor Zadotny mentioned, I'm here today. My name is Bruce Ortiz uh, with Vision Point Marketing, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, Katie Campbell, who will be co-presenting the findings that we ha uh, are excited to present as part of this research and discovery process and uh, recommending a name option and brand development platform for uh, the new combined entity. Um, I also have additional colleagues that are joining me from Vision Point, Erica Kim and Holly Simons as well, who will be uh, uh, joining uh, the conversation and uh, later discussion as we um, wrap up our presentation. As Chancellor Zadotny mentioned, um, and as you are aware, the Vermont State College's system is undergoing an exciting and significant transformation wherein Castleton University, Northern Vermont University and Vermont Technical College are combining to form one new university. The Vermont State College's system has engaged Vision, uh, Vision Point as a partner to support a component of the broader transformation initiative that is currently underway. Uh, specifically, Vision Point was engaged to provide a strategic recommendation for the brand platform uh, of the new combined entity. So today, we're excited to share with you an initial uh, yet important step forward in the brand platform development process. We'll share with you an overview of our research and discovery process and the key insights and learnings distilled from this process leading us up to this point. And finally, we'll briefly cover an overview of what's to come, after which we'll open up for discussion. It, as we're going through this presentation, we invite you to keep in mind that while we're reaching an important milestone in the um, VSC transformation, this is chapter one of a much larger story of the brand, brand platform Vision Point is recommending for the new combined entity. And to further illustrate this, we need to clarify what is a brand platform as its interpretation can vary. To the brand platform that Vision Point will be recommending for the new combined entity will reflect the institution name, pillars and personality traits, messaging points, and logo mark. Beyond the brand platform recommended by Vision Point, there are additional components managed directly by the Vermont State College's system that are currently underway as well related to the new combined entity. Areas that Chancellor Zadotny mentioned earlier, such as the vision and mission and program array for the new combined entity will be shared uh, by the VSC in the coming months. But today, we'll focus on the naming recommendation and supporting insights that help to inform its selection. And once there is consensus on this name, Vision Point looks forward to sharing the additional elements of the brand platform, which will help to further illustrate the brand, bring it to life, and build more excitement for all that is to come. So bringing focus back to the process and approach of brand development, I wanted to pause on this quote from Kierkegaard. And while it's paraphrased, uh, what it translates to is, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. And what this statement reflects is to honor the past, celebrate the present, and embrace the future. The spirit of this statement resonated in our process as we got to know Castleton University, Northern Vermont University, and Vermont Tech through the research and discovery process. And as we began our process, we understood a few things. We understood that there are strong connections and affinity to each institution's history and community, that there is a, a passionate commitment in the value and importance of both technical and liberal arts education as a part of the future. And we also understood that we needed to consider as we were developing this brand platform and naming options or recommendation rather, uh, that we have to consider how this platform enables continued 
future growth and evolution for the new combined entity. And, and finally, what you know to begin this process, we knew all options were on the table. <laughs> there was not a, a brand platform or direction for the name or brand platform that um, you know we were trying to drive toward. Uh, we really entered into this process with an, with an open mind and open ears to listen to feedback, uh, gather the research insights to help provide a, a well-informed recommendation to the board. So to that end, we dove into uh, a, an extensive research and discovery process uh, that Chancellor Zadotny kind of provided an overview of, um, and which included a market research brand perception study in the entire state of Vermont. Uh, it included a combined brand workshop that uh, where representatives from across all three institutions uh, participated in. We held stakeholder interviews and in what we call is our, our listening tour. Um, again, across all institutions where we held uh, dedicated focus groups across various stakeholder groups so that we can gather qualitative feedback and input um, from the various stakeholders across the many institutions. And then um, as well, we uh, conducted the brand perception study that I mentioned earlier and, and, and conducted our own mar independent market research. Additionally, we conducted a brand and marketing audit for each institution, which combined with the activities that I had previously mentioned, what we, what we sought to gain is a, a deeper understanding of each institution, such as their key characteristics, audience communication, values and missions for each institution, and sense of place and relationship with their local community. And finally, in addition to examining the Vermont State College System institutions themselves, we also researched the spectrum of in-state and out-of-state competitors and peer institutions, including ones that the VSC selected and identified as direct competitors or peers, and ones identified by Vision Point as a beneficial reference to also investigate. Our understanding of the competitive landscape and peer landscape uh, really is important to help us identify opportunities in which we can either assimilate into the landscape where it's appropriate, um, as well as to identify what are the opportunities for us to stand out, for the, for the new combined entity to stand out and, and have unique differentiators among the competition. This helps to inform multiple facets of our engagement and brand development, such as uh, brand positioning, the pillars that I mentioned earlier, uh, logo definition, as well as naming, um, which we're discussing today. And through our discovery session, discussions and research, although Castleton, NVU and Vermont Tech are distinct institutions within the Vermont State Colleges system, common themes across the institutions quickly began to surface, fairly immediately actually. Uh, and while this word cloud is, is not intended to uh, you know, represent a, or it's for representation purposes really only, it does highlight many of the common themes that we heard and learned. So common themes such as Vermont, more than a number, welcoming, community, student-focused and applied learning. These were um, common themes that resonated throughout our conversations and, and were submitted as part of the brand perception study um, as additional feedback that we learned. And so really, you know, as, as we summarize the effort and feedback that we heard, uh, this quote captured from the brand perception study, I, I believe is an appropriate summarization of these common themes. Uh, this is in response to the question, why does the respondent believe that the VSC, VSC would be undergoing this transformation? And this respondent stated, they are consolidating to better suit the Vermont community as a whole. This way they can offer the best possible service to their students. The spirit of this statement underpins the common themes that we heard and the idea of the institutions coming together to form something that benefits Vermont overall, working both in service of Vermont and highlighting uh, the strengths of it. So with that framing in mind, we surveyed several naming options for, uh, the, for the new combined entity. And these options reflected themes we heard and learned from research uh, options to position the NCE well, looking ahead and taking note of, of the future vision and taking into consideration the higher education landscape in general and how this name establishes points of parity and distinction among other institutions. 
and as well as how the name positions the NCE locally in state, regionally, as well as on a national scale for future growth. So the, the key takeaways and directional insights that we learned for the naming and brand identity are, are represented here. And what they reflect are Vermont is intrinsic to your identity. Vermont, you know, can have many different, it, it can convey many different um, meanings and interpretations. And in this context, what we, uh, what we heard and learned is Vermont meaning the relationship with your community, the workforce and economy, your connection to Vermont's connection rather to the student experience, the environment, uh, this theme of uh, Vermont is our campus. The other thing we heard as well is the importance of university as a, as a term or as a, a phrase as part of the naming convention. Through our, our listening to our sessions and feedback, the inclusion of university was a, a critical component that was raised multiple times as critical to communicate the prestige and quality and the level of education that uh, this NCE will be providing. And then finally, a theme that, uh, that resonated is advancement, innovation, and, and technology. You know, this is another theme that we heard um, reflecting the commitment to the future through advancement, innovation, and technology, meaning the transformative experience, uh, transformative student experience, excuse me, uh, innovation and technology and, and pioneering education in Vermont. And pioneering meaning education in terms of quality, the experiential and applied learning, uh, pioneering the uh, offerings of multiple modalities to increase accessibility and uh, for, uh, pioneering affordability to education within the state of Vermont. And so with, with these key themes in mind, uh, we explored many different naming options and, and many different variations of this naming option, knowing that Vermont is critical to include as part of the naming, naming convention, as well as university being a critical part, um, all then summarizing uh, advancement, innovation, and technology. And, you know, we're really excited to be sharing the, um, our naming recommendation. And, and with that, actually, I'm going to be uh, transitioning over uh, the latter half of this presentation to my colleague, Katie Campbell, who will speak through uh, the uh, naming recommendations and, and our findings to, uh, in support of it. Thank you so much, Bruce. Yes, and as Bruce mentioned, so with all of this in mind, there were many names that made it onto the consideration set of what should we be calling this new combined entity in this NCE during the VSC's transformation over these next few months. And you know, as those names came onto the consideration set, we then vetted them, vetted them through legality, vetted them through our subcommittees and our governance groups, vetted them through the research and strategies that we had brought forward through all of that work that Bruce just uh, walked us through. And with all of that, we are excited to share a name that we believe is both strong and agile that could be expected, but is also aspirational for all that is to come from this NCE. We believe this name represents both the institutions as they currently are, the history that they've cultivated, the loyalty and brand affiliation that they have um, currently, while also being able to encompass this new unified university and, and our kind of hopes for that mission and vision of this uh, of our, our new entity. So one other piece to keep in mind is there's a lot of value in immediate associations of to what a name conveys. Bruce mentioned both Vermont and university and how critical those two naming elements were. But we also wanted to make sure we were putting together a name recommendation that could uh, very much illustrate the new institution's support of rural communities, the access to education, the affordability, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what an important priority that is for this institution. All of that while also leaving us room to be flexible and to grow and evolve as the times do and as our needs do and as very much our constituents needs do. So with that said, I think excited to share our chapter one, as we'll say, in this brand story or this first piece of this larger brand platform. And the name that we would like to put up for consideration very much is Vermont State University. And as Bruce has chatted through how we got there with this research and discovery process, we would love to focus the next few slides more on the findings that directly support Vermont State University beyond those initial ones current already discussed. So within that process of 
coming to the name of Vermont State University from that larger list of on our consideration set. When we look to our brand perception study, the Vermont concept was the most popular when aggregating opinions across the different audience groups. It was the first choice among state residents, 35% of whom selected it as their uh, preferred naming concept, but also the first choice among alumni, faculty, and staff. And we don't want to undersell or understate the importance of internal buy-in. We, as I know was mentioned at the top, we're a higher education marketing firm and have done a couple of brand projects in the past. And we have gone down the road of the name not being the one that was preferred internally. And that's okay. It just creates a different set of kind of project uh, priorities as we move forward. That internal advocacy that we hope for by using a name that could be preferred by alumni, by faculty and staff will allow us to take um, larger advantage of that group as we move forward in their excitement for all that to, is to come. Also with that Vermont concept that was tested in the market study, we wanted to look at what key aspects of the university's vision were related to this name. And are those our top priorities as well? And we found that that was very much in alignment with the support of supporting the vitality of rural communities being the top, uh, the top uh, feature there, accessible to learners of all backgrounds, as well as being artistic and culturally vibrant. So understanding that by using this Vermont concept in our naming convention, we were able to create automatic or quick associations with some of the pieces that are so critical to the future of the mission and vision uh, statement of this institution. For the word state and kind of along those lines, why there may be the question of why is that included in this name? And why did we make the decision after uh, kind of moving through this process that this was the best option for us and the one that we truly believe our research stands behind? Well, the top associations with state also reflect key aspects of the new university's um, uh, vision and, and mission that we've kind of been um, chatting through over the last few weeks, including being accessible to learners of all backgrounds, as we saw in the previous slides, diversity, equity, and inclusion coming through with this concept, which we know is very critical and important to us, as well as another uh, re-mention of supporting the vitality of rural communities. So with all of this said, we're able to look not only across our market study, but also across our larger research set and discovery work that we've been conducting over the last few months to determine that this name of Vermont State University really does have a strength in emulating the pieces of our mission and vision that we so highly value and know are the future state of our university and what our constituents are looking for and also what we're hoping to accomplish while also still being representative and true to the current universities and their distinct attributes and brands that they have now. So a couple of key takeaways just to put all of this in summation, you know, the name emphasizes the state of Vermont. It conveys strong aspects of being a public entity and public entities typically have a understood knowledge that this is a mutually beneficial relationship between both the state and its people and its students and the future of the state and the workforce. It is able to convey accessibility, affordability, and as I was mentioning, that mission to really serve its people, current residents of Vermont or residents of Vermont that the institution could bring in. This naming structure provides a unifying platform and offers flexibility and customization. We talked about that importance of agility and being able to um, you know, have a lot of flexibility in the way that we take this name and apply it to different schools or departments or locations. And with that simplicity and clarity, we have a lot of options to do that in the future phases of this brand platform. It also very much reflects and reinforces this idea that we heard in our research and in our listening tours through and through, which is Vermont is our campus. And the brand of Vermont is very significant and important. Vermont can stand for not only its beautiful landscapes and geographies, maybe its open-mindedness and welcoming culture that is known of the state. And that's very important to now share on a national level for prospective students, parents, others in the higher ed community so that they understand also the culture that's reflected at Vermont State University at this new unified institution. And we heard this across campuses. 
uh, as we look to kind of understand our charge as your partners in this work, our charge was to not truly negotiate between institutions and universities. We were not looking to take something from Castleton at the demise of NVU or vice versa. We, our charge was very much to find that unifying common thread across all of the institutions that also felt authentic and very much reflective of what we hope for in our new combined entity. And just a couple of quotes to show how we heard that throughout our listening tour. We not only saw it in the data, but we heard it through each of these sessions. A Castleton senior leadership mentioning that Castleton provides upward mobility for the residents, which allows them to continue to serve Vermont. Again, that mutually beneficial relationship between state and people and students. Uh, a Vermont Tech faculty member talking about how Vermont Tech is transformative for many people, transformational even, across this breadth of audience members, speaking very much to those affiliations that were associated with both the Vermont and the state concept. We saw this also at NVU when a Johnson Select Board and member and community member mentioned that NVU is not only part of our local community, but the state as a whole. Yes, it's specific locations, but it has an effect on the larger um, geography of the entire state of Vermont and that being a key and a very important factor. And then an engineering executive when we were chatting with uh, community members around the Vermont Tech campus areas mentioning Vermont Tech is a state school, so their primary responsibility is to their constituents. They seem to cater to the to Vermont students, Vermont as a whole. And as we're speaking of this, we're not trying to emphasize Vermont and Vermont only. It's more very much highlighting and celebrating the brand of Vermont and of Vermont State University and all the locations that make that up to, yes, serve the people of Vermont, also to serve out-of-state students or out-of-state constituents that could then come and um, contribute to the larger Vermont culture and entity. The other piece of all this that we want to consider is, you know, this naming convention and if that's well known or familiar, will there need to be learning for our audience members on what Vermont State University is? We know there will be as it's a new institution, but one thing that is working in our favor as with this name is that there are many comparable names as we look across the country and across higher education. And the word state being included in the name does not take from any prestige or any um, status that we would like our new institution to hold. Some comparable names to consider, some that probably have already come to mind for you while listening on this call, Michigan State University, North Carolina State University, Illinois State University, Pennsylvania State University and the Ohio State University, as well as many more. And as we think about the ability to be agile and how important that is, and as we were talking about, uh, you know, that we really want to be able to celebrate and highlight not only the history of these different campuses and locations, but also have a flexibility in how we present that externally. So with Vermont State University, we are not pigeonholed into one shorthand or one um, naming convention or architecture as we continue to develop in this process. If we look just across those examples, Michigan State University very much being known as Michigan State, NC State in North Carolina, sometimes NCSU, we have Ohio State or OSU Penn State. So we're not specifically putting ourselves in one bucket right now as to this is Vermont State University and this is the shorthand. That is part of one of the excited pieces that is to come. So we've got a lot ahead of us as we continue looking forward in this process. And some of those factors of what that looks like is within the upcoming months, taking this name, but being able to contextualize it much more, reinforce it and further build excitement for it. And how we'll do that is through the brand platform, which Bruce was chatting about at the top of this presentation. That's where we'll dive into the pillars, the core, p uh, the core uh, pieces of this institution that make it up and that we say are the priorities for it the personality traits, how we communicate, how we talk through things with our students or legislatures or different audience members, and key messaging points. What is What are the proof points that back that up? How do we prove that those pillars are truly our pillars and that we bring those to life? We also will look into the exploration of that brand name architecture. So what does this look like for specific locations or for specific programs or schools or departments? And how does that then bring the brand and give it legs? How does it bring it to life in specific um, in specific instances on both external marketing as well as internal communications. 
And then probably the piece that's the most exciting is in the visualization of that through logo marks. And some of this will absolutely be communicated at the October board meeting. We'll also continue to work through it over the next couple of months as we look to gather further feedback and really refine this to make sure that we're bringing this Vermont State University to the marketplace in its best position with its best foot forward to, as we've been mentioning, not only be very much in recognition of all the fantastic work that's been done in the state of Vermont in public education, especially at these three institutions, but really what's to come in the future. We are looking forward to it as higher ed constituents, as your partners in this process, but very much for your prospective students, your faculty, your staff, your alums, and gaining that excitement and anticipation for them for this new combined entity. So with that, as you review this information and ahead of your listening sessions that we believe to happen this week, please let us know if there's other information that would be helpful in your consideration. And that concludes our presentation of today's name recommendation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I just want to point out that um, we want to remind everyone that there will be making a link to the presentation and the presentation slides publicly available, and we'll be providing a link for public feedback on the recommendation later today. And the board will be holding a virtual listening session on Wednesday, September 29th at 6.30 p.m. There will be campus visits this week and into next week on in person at the campuses and in the colleges. And we invite everyone to come to those and, and give us some feedback. We want to listen to what you have to say. Um, there will be uh, both the, the feedback that we're going to have before we vote. Um, the details for all of this will be sent to the faculty, staff, and students via email. And uh, we obviously have um, a time today for public comment on the agenda. Um, are there any questions for the people from Vision Point at this point? Jim Maslin. Thank you. Um, good so far. Thank you very much. It's all straightforward and it all makes very good sense. Um, my, my comment has to do with, with uh, NVU and the, uh, the uh, moniker that was attached to it, which is Do North, which I thought was fascinating, you know, fantastic. So I, I wonder going forward, what we'll do with what you guys will recommend with regards to um, marketing sorts of things. I mean, we could hardly say um, do Northeast, South and West, you know, um, and I, but you get the point. Um, but there was something at least over here on my side of the state that, that worked very, very well about do North. And I'm just adding that as uh, for your consideration, um, what's the, uh, What's the buzz in the bonnet here that's going to take this forward? In addition to it, a perfectly straightforward and um, and lo and logical and honorable name. So, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Do Bruce and Katie want to make a comment on that, or are we just going to keep that? So I, I'm, I'm happy to comment that in that. Yeah. So the in terms of where this will go next, that's kind of the beauty of this naming recommendation is there's a very solid foundation of what the name immediately can uh, the associations that are already being drawn with the name, as well as what the name um, based on our research and um, constituent feedback immediately conveys. And so from there, then these next exciting pieces that uh, Katie had referenced in terms of the um, you know, brand development, the personality, the key value points, including something like what you just mentioned, Jim, of due north, it will only help to further advance um, and, and round out the new combined entities um, overall brand, which includes the name uh, taglines and marketing materials, what that brand promise is that will be then conveyed and communicated throughout your uh, marketing collateral. And, and while you can't say due north, east, south, um, it certainly recognize that where um, there's uh, a, you know, a opportunity is in you know, what, what we heard pretty loud and clear is that Vermont is your campus. 
and you know that's not to state that you know that's going to be the the tagline or anything um, uh, by any means. But that spirit, uh, I think, touches upon the due north that um, is associated with NVU, and you know we know that that's a, a common. Um, or we understand that it's a common um, talking point or marketing point that's already associated with uh, CCV, which is a sister institution within Vermont State um, College's system. And, um, you know, that as an underpinning spirit, there's, um, there's power in that, in that connection that unifies all of the institutions that are under the Vermont State College's um, sister, uh, system umbrella. Um, but certainly these are things that we will be continuing to explore as we're further defining and uh, rounding out the brain platform overall. All right, uh, Pat Moulton, president of VTC. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to say a couple of things. Um, first, I just say, I, I have to admit my first impression of this name wasn't exciting to me in the least, um, but likely because we've seen this name before and it really didn't seem to me to be that creative. However, I've, I've turned the corner, I've done a 180 and I'm heartened that the research has really brought us back to this name. And I really truly appreciate that the opportunities that this name presents, uh, this, the opportunities for us to brand this well and to not lock us into one stream of thinking. This really is a palette, as Sophie described, from which we can paint many branded pictures spanning the liberal arts and our advanced technology programs. I'm further ecstatic that the research pulled out the prominence of the need for names to reflect technology and innovation as core concepts. That's critical, as you would imagine you'd hear from the president of Vermont Technical College. That is our brand innovation technology and one that must clearly be reflected in our new name, brand structure and program array. At this moment, we're seeing part of the picture with the rest to be colored in, in the coming weeks. I urge us all to keep in mind, this is not a standalone, this is a start. It's chapter one, as Bruce and others have said. It will be important to assure that the characteristics of innovation, technology, career focused, great outcomes are captured in our continued branding and naming work. That is what has and will continue to differentiate the Vermont State Colleges from others. Our focus on teaching what's relevant today while understanding the history of our various disciplines. With great outcomes from all of us, which launch careers as well as build leaders and people who have and will continue to change the world. Our campus is Vermont, we serve the state, we are and will be a university with all the diversity that that provides. That name seems to fit. I'm really anxious to hear the next phase of brand development to help assure unique and inviting characteristics of our three institutions are captured and nurtured. Thank you. Anyone else? Trying to see if I see any hands here. Um, uh, Sean Tester. Thank you. Uh, looks like really great work and a lot of thought went into this. Uh, ultimately, I think it's pretty straightforward and, and uh, is a uh, solid um, uh, suggestion, recommendation. One thought that did cross my mind, and I've been thinking about this a lot, is brand confusion. Oh, right. Yeah. University of Vermont. And I was wondering if any thought or consideration had been put into that. Um, maybe it's not an issue, but you know they are going to share uh, two letters in their, uh, you know, an acronym. Uh, thank you for that question, Sean. And there was a great deal of consideration that went into uh, considering your peer institution within the same state of the University of Vermont. Um, we looked at a, a couple of different things. So knowing that Vermont, from the feedback, Vermont and university uh, were critical components to include as part of the naming convention and overall brand. Uh, there, there are many unique uh, you know, iterations and variations that we explored combining those two na uh, uh, names within the overall structure. Um, but we did have to be very mindful, um, you know, as Katie mentioned, certainly from a legal standpoint, that there was not um, 
that there wasn't any conflict with this naming structure, as well as from a market standpoint and just uh, external perception and, and understanding that there wasn't market confusion. Um, but what we did find and um, somewhat referenced in the slides of comparable names is institutions with similar naming conventions can coexist within the same state. So for each of the um, naming or comparable states that were referenced in terms of uh, Michigan State University, there's also a University of Michigan for ISU or Illinois State University. There's also a University of Illinois. Um, same with Ohio, um, Ohio State, NC State, and Penn State. Um, and that is an example that you see across the, um, across the higher ed institution uh, space, rather. And the interesting thing that we found, so in the example of um, Penn State, Penn State is the, you know, the public or state-funded institution, whereas the University of Pennsylvania is the private or Ivy League uh, institution. And so we did see that um, not only can both institutions exist, but they can also exist where one is private and one is state funded. And what this name with Vermont State University really helps to um, reinforce and, um, and claim is that Vermont State University, you all are, are claiming ownership as a public institution and as the um, public institution for Vermonters and of Vermonters um, that also then is a welcoming institution for out of state on a national scale or regional scale. So um, uh, certainly a lot of uh, research and, and insight went into, uh, into the naming convention to ensure that there wasn't any conflict um, at all and that both can exist within the same state. Yeah, I think one other point I'd add on there is even though we haven't determined what that shorthand for the university will be, that's another area that we can start to your point, Sean, just distinguish a little bit more when we're when both names are thrown out there for prospective students. And what's great about the Vermont State University name is that Vermont is first. We we really get to own and lead with that. And so whether we go with Vermont State or Vermont State University or VSA, whatever we decide to go down in the, the next iterations of this process, we do get to, I think, just even distinguish ourselves with the with the order of operations, if you will, versus a UVM or University of Vermont and and all the benefits that they provide for the state as well. So uh, we just tried to think of it too from a perspective students. Con uh, consideration set or even a prospective parents uh, perspective, whether that's a first gen student or someone who's gone through the, you know, parents who are very familiar with this process and what that might look like. And because it's a familiar naming convention across other states and across our country, as well as different ways we could distinguish through the shorthand, we think we will be able to avoid any of that direct market confusion. Anyone else have any questions for Bruce or Kim? Vision point. Um, I guess I could either ask the people from Vision Point or um, the Chancellor, what is the next step? Of course. So, in terms of the next step here, uh, you know, as we mentioned, looking ahead, the name convention is the springboard. So, um, we understand that from here, uh, there will be a uh, a week process where you'll continue to gather community feedback and um, and have that information and insight then uh, inform your decisions to when you will then reconvene uh, on September 29th uh, to uh, finalize your vote. From there, then that information will be shared with Vision Point, uh, who will, in parallel path will be continuing to work through the further brand development and platform op, um, components that I mentioned earlier in terms of the pillars, personality, the um, and then the more visual elements and and um, as well as the message, messaging points. Um, and then um, I understand that the you know as part of the transformation overall the additional components that are to come in the upcoming months are the um, mission and vision of the uh, new combined entity as well as the program array which um, you know will be uh, you know coming shortly from the uh, Vermont State College system. Okay thank you any other questions any comments well I would like to thank the people from Vision Point for a very uh, interesting and comprehensive uh, chapter one description. Um, and we look forward to whatever is coming next and we will be in touch with you as we, as we do contact people from the different campuses and, and colleges. Thank you. Um,
Thank you. Yeah. Okay, the next thing on the agenda is the report of the Finance and Facilities Committee. I'm going to turn to uh, Sharon Scott, since our chairman is not here today, um, and the vice chair is not here today either, but for different reasons. But Sharon, can you go over, please, the, um, the report from the, uh, we have some things that we have to vote on, and I think you could go through those for us anytime Absolutely. now. Absolutely. So um, there was a finance and facilities committee meeting scheduled on August 23rd. And at that meeting, we spoke uh, about uh, unaudited financial results, as well as received a government affairs update. Um, and two items were identified and moved forward for voting. And they are are related to two endowments for Northern Vermont University. The first is to create the Elizabeth Dulcy uh, Scholarship in Science Endowment. Elizabeth Dulcy is a long serving faculty member in the sciences department who retired this past spring. And um, this would create a scholarship for needy Vermonter or needy students in the sciences attending the Johnson campus of Northern Vermont University. Um, the second endowment is um, a name change for the Sugarman Scholarship and to change it to the Carrie Seduto Scholarship Endowment. Um, Ms. Seduto, Seduto sold the Sugarman, uh, a long running family business earlier this year and would like to rename the scholarship uh, in her name. Um, there's also a small addition to that scholarship to add agriculture to the field of study that individuals may aspire to and a change to remove its restrictions to only going towards female students. Um, so both of those are available for um, up for approval with the board. Okay, so we need, um, we need, um... Would it be easier to do one at a time or together, both of them? Uh, I think we can do both of them together. Is that correct, Patty? Or Sophie? That, oh, no, that Patty. is correct. Sorry, I gotta get the get gotta get right on the right buttons. Um, that is correct. As long as there's no questions um, about either one separately, then um, as long as you have that opportunity, the motion can be for both. Okay, so I need a motion to create the Elizabeth Dolce Scholarship and Science Endowment and to change the name of an existing endowment to the Sugarman Seduto Endowment. Uh, do I hear a motion on that behalf? Sue Zeller is making that motion. Uh, second, Karen Luno. Is there any discussion or questions on these changes? Jim seems to indicate a positive. Anyone <laughs> else have any questions? Uh, all those, is hearing none, all those in favor of changing the, or establishing and changing the name of those endowments, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, any, any opposition? It doesn't appear to have any, so those are changed. Uh, is there anything else that we need to be aware of in the presentation from the, uh, Facilities and Finance Committee, or is that something we'll get to another time? Uh, facilities and Finance, just a, a quick update for those who are not at the committee meeting. Um, early results for FY21 are favorable in comparison to budget and favorable in comparison to the third quarter. Um, we anticipate that we'll have around $20 million um, in excess funds, excess revenue over expenses. Um, as we discussed yesterday in the public session at the retreat, um, there are many needs that the Vermont State Colleges has for those funds. So um, we aren't thinking them of them as surplus, but as our ability to be able to begin to set the VSC on a sound financial footing as we move forward. And finance and facilities will be working on that work in the coming months. Uh, the next meeting that's scheduled for them is in October. Um, when we will have the, both the audit committee and the finance and facility committees meetings scheduled. Yes, and I just want to clarify that $20 million includes the transformation budget that this legislature gave us of as it works out $20 million. Um, actually, those funds are separate. Um, so those funds are separate, but yes, it'll mention much of that fun those funding, it comes from the state. Um, it comes from our ability to have received some substantial bridge funding. And then also the HERF funding that we received in form of the higher education emergency relief funds. Yes, yes, a variety of federal funds that have been made available, one-time money, okay. Absolutely, one-time funds. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or concerns about 
the finance and facilities. Seeing none, uh, we will move along to the report on EPSL, which is um, primarily the program array optimization report that we heard from uh, RPK. Uh, I will turn that over to Megan Kluver, who will go and, uh, and Yasmin, who will go and go through that for us. Excellent. Thank you, Lynn. And we have a, a brief report today on the meeting that we had in late August. As you say, primarily that meeting was focused on um, an update on the tremendous progress that faculty have made over the summer on the program array. Um, and I did want to spend just a couple of minutes and pull some of the highlights of that um, discussion into our meeting today, um, because I think the faculty, we had several faculty members who joined our EPSL meeting. Um, and in addition to hearing the report on progress, they took some time amid the first week of classes to really give the committee a look into, a, into the process that they're undertaking to actually optimize the programs and to build the future of what programs at, at the new institution will look like. Um, and I would, I would say two, two key takeaways from those conversations. And as Jasmine shared yesterday, moving from 250 programs to 100 across um, the campuses of the new institution, which is, is tremendous. Um, the, the takeaways from that discussion, one, optimization looks different for every program. And that really came through um, in the, the presentations that we listened to. Faculty are being incredibly thoughtful about how to make dynamic programs work for the different campuses and how to create hybrid and how to create high flex options in service to the goal of statewide delivery. And one constant that came through throughout the three presentations was the benefit to students of this optimization. And I'd say one of the other aspects of that that came through was some of the benefits perhaps were unexpected by faculty as they embarked on this and as they started to get to know and understand what colleagues across the system were doing, um, it became clear that there were pieces that could be pulled through to benefit students across Vermont. Um, so to give you a, a quick flavor of what we heard, and I apologize because I will not do this justice, um, Dr. John Kidder, who's an engineering professor at Vermont Tech, shared with us that as the engineering programs are optimizing, they're adopting high flex delivery that will enable access via Zoom to lectures and computer labs for all first year engineering technology courses. And that's involving not only consolidating the programs, but also outfitting lecture and computer labs with new instructor stations and additional monitors, monitors to optimize the student experience for students who are attending those lectures remotely. Uh, we also heard from Dr. Hannah Miller of Northern Vermont University, um, and she spoke about the program optimization across education programs. And she was very passionate about the opportunities that it created to look across the programs and to consider as a merged department how they're preparing future teachers and professional development in service to teachers in optimized options and creating and pulling through the concepts of inclusive education across the coursework um, throughout that program. And then lastly, we heard from Dr. Andrew Alexander, um, currently at Castleton University in the Humanities, who talked about the proposal that they are working through combining history programs across the three institutions into one program. And he talked about the fact that students will be able to move through the programs at any of the campuses and coordinate the offerings and the coordinated offerings and schedules will make it easier for students to choose from a wider variety of electives. Um, and whereas in the past, they had separate capstone classes. In the future, they'll have one capstone experience that will be offered from a smart classroom location. And the physical location of those classes will rotate among the campuses, enabling students to be part of a larger cohort and to benefit from a wide variety of faculty instructors. 
So I share those brief vignettes. Um, we had much longer presentations from those faculty members, but I think it helped the committee to really understand how faculty are spending the time to really be thoughtful about how they can bring different tools across um, the programs as they think about program optimization and how that program optimization is going to look different across each of these 100 programs that we will ultimately end up with. We also heard just from a numbers perspective, there's still work to be done. Um, there are 28 programs as of yesterday that still need um, additional review and refinement, and there are 14 programs that need significant additional work and review. Um, so the committee did leave that discussion with a request out to the CAOs working with um, Yasmin to come back at our October meeting, and for each of the programs that are still um, either requiring significant work and review or um, requiring refinements to um, bring each of those programs to the EPSIL committee and share with the committee uh, what the roadblocks are to making progress and what the milestones are in terms of when those 14 and 28 programs will make substantial progress towards uh, reaching that optimization goal. And then lastly, uh, we did as a committee discuss the precip reviews. Those are reviews that are conducted on each program on a rolling basis as directed by board policy. The review primarily involves faculty preparing a program self-study document. Um, those reports are then provided to the CIOs and ultimately delivered to each president and then ultimately presented to the EPSL committee. Given the ongoing program work and the extensive work that faculty are undertaking to optimize programs, um, the CIOs did request that this policy be temporarily suspended. EPSL discussed that and did want to bring a motion to the board um, to suspend uh, pol VSC policy 101, which is program review and continuous improvement process for the 21-22 and for the 22-23 cycles, given the program rate work that is currently underway. So I'd like to put that motion to the board. Okay, thank you. Uh, does Yasmin have anything further to add to that or have we covered most of it? Uh, no, Megan has covered it. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Janet. Um, something I forgot to ask yesterday, or I think maybe require, is that as the um, as these programs are redeveloped, um, I think we have to be very careful to not let CCB become its own thing and lose our connectivity to the rest of the system. So, um, just like I know. I just I know one example in particular because I worked with Joyce and Pat on it, which was how you went from being a uh, taking the manufacturing technician certification, and then if you took these classes at CCV, you could then enter this program at Vermont Tech, and it was mostly you know an engineering technician kind of roadmap that also showed you how to get to be a four year, etc. I think for every one of these programs that's being redesigned for the for the new entity, um, CCV has to be required to provide the on-ramp program from CCV to get into those. Um, so, you know, if you go to CCV and take A, B, and C, you'd be really ready to take the engineering program at whatever. So let's, I think we, and I think as trustees, we need to require that so we don't lose the connectivity of CCV to the rest of the system. Thank, thank you for that, Janet. And I'll just clarify that as part of the, the final reports this summer, we did ask faculty to identify what the, what the CCV pathway might look like, recognizing, and in most cases, there, there was a CCV pathway already in place. And I would say that these pathways are always a, um, something that needs to be constructed from both sides, the CCV and the four-year program working together to, to create a workable pathway. Um, but I think we saw by and large that programs see those see those pathways. They may need some tweaking now that we have new optimized programs, but there's certainly there's a foundation there. Yeah, I just want to make it, I just think as trustees, we have to create the expectation that we expect CCV and the other new entity to stay connected 
that it's a requirement. Mm -hmm. That's all. I just don't, I, I, that's great that that's already happening, but I don't want to lose that that becomes just a good thing to do and not something we expect. Um, we, we don't know, I was thinking about this last night, you know, we don't know where, where our U.S. government will go, but, you know, there's plenty of talk of free uh, community college, and if that comes to bear, we need to make sure the rest of our system leverages that, um, and that CCV is our biggest, should be our biggest, one of our biggest on-ramps to the rest of the system, so um, we don't, and we don't want one of the other universities in our fine state to capitalize on that before we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, that's a good point. And um, I'm glad we're going to go and hear a report on the other 28 and 16 or 14 programs that are moving, they need to do more. Uh, that's a, that's, we need to stay on top of that as well. Uh, anybody have any other discussion? So one other point to, your, to your motion, Megan, I can support that as long as we have a caveat that said, should progress not continue? Um, on the program improvement or whatever we are naming it, that the, the board has the right to revoke that, <laughs> right? And say, sorry, we're going back to what we used to do. I, I totally support we shouldn't do that now when, with good progress, but I do want the ability to go back to that if for some reason progress doesn't continue. Okay, so that's a good point. So that gives us a, a decision on a motion um, Megan, can you do a motion that might include what um, the trustee Bombardier included? Yes. So I said the motion is to for the board to approve the suspension of VSC policy 101, which is program review and continuous improvement process for both the 2021-22 and the 2022-23 cycles. Um, as long as continued progress, con as long as progress continues to be strong in resolving the programs that need to be optimized for the program array. Okay. Um, anyhow, and we need a second on that. Uh, Mary will second that. Um, any discussion? Any thoughts? Um, let's see, uh, the CCV issue has been brought up. Does President Judy have any comments on her pathways and how this has been included or how we can proceed to make sure that connectivity is there? Hi, um, Lynn, thank you. Um, and I appreciate um, Janet's comment because I do think it's important to make sure we, as the, as the programs, um, change at the other schools that we maintain the pathways. And certainly there's been every indication that that will continue. Um, but I do think that's important um, because we have pathways with all the privates and publics throughout the state of Vermont and beyond. And we wanna make sure within our own system that it's the easiest mm -hmm. um, for students to go from CCV to um, this new entity. So that's really important. It's important. It's important for Vermont as we think about serving Vermont and Vermonters. This is these pathways are incredibly important. So. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion or questions on that? Uh, seeing none. All those in favor of the motion to uh, suspend the VSC Policy 101 Program Review and Conference Improvement Process with a caveat that we continue the optimization process. Please indicate by saying yes. Yes. Uh, aye. Aye. Uh, anyone opposed? Aye. Seeing none, the motion is passed. And I wish the people with um, the EPSL committee and the people doing the uh, optimization, uh, you know, the best of luck as we continue to, to deal with the other remaining programs and continue with this process. It was a very, very yeah, encouraging and, and uh, exciting EPSL committee to listen to the presentations from the faculty. Um, okay, we now have reports from our presidents. Uh, we will, um, we're asking for a five to eight minute oral report. It's not gonna be as detailed as it's been in the past, probably, but we, um, on how things are going and the highlights of what are you considered to be the, uh, 
the importance of your activities to the board. Uh, we'll start out with uh, President Moulton from Vermont Tech. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, we could go back to the traditional uh, alphabetized and ask for uh, Joyce Judy to give a report on CCV. Sure, I'm happy to, to do that. And um, I will uh, respect your time constraints as well. Um, actually, there's three or four things I just wanna mention. Um, I think that um, as was mentioned yesterday, um, we had a really strong fall enrollment. And so we're very happy with that. Um, enrollment as of this morning is up 6% from last fall. And I just wanna remind the board that we were up 3% um, last fall from um, the previous fall. So um, it's we're feeling good um, about where we are, but I also wanna just acknowledge that I think thanks to all the support from the legislature, around um, the number of um, we've, we, the number of scholarships and the way we were able to address affordability. I think this is a real um, a positive sign that when we do work on affordability, we do see more Vermonters accessing and investing in themselves and, and, and taking college courses. And so you know a year ago we had the McClure Foundation gift and then um, we had an uptick then. And this um, last fall. So I think that um, you know we can't. We no longer can say affordability is not one of the factors that influences the college going rate for Vermonters. Um, and just as a reminder for people who haven't heard me say this ten thousand times, that Vermont has one of the highest high school graduation rates and one of the lowest college going rates. And but I think this is. Um, and we also are one of the most expensive community colleges in the country. So you put all those things together. And I think that um, this is beginning to say, you know what, um, cost is a factor. Um, now it's not the total factor. It's not all, the only reason, but I think it's something we can't overlook. Um, I think the other thing that has really um, worked to our favor in terms of enrollment, um, Megan Kluver asked me yesterday, you know, why, um, what do I why do I think CCV's enrollments are up? Because I will tell you that the rest of the nation, most community colleges are experiencing a five to 15% decline. I can't tell you why. I hope all the things we put in place really are um, helping. I think um, um, one of the things I wanna call your attention to is in the packet that I gave to you yesterday um, is um, an update on the highlight of our strategic plan accomplishments. And I think you're gonna see, I mean, it, when we put this together, the last, in spite of COVID, the amount of activity and work that has been going on has been um, pretty phenomenal. And so the two things I wanna highlight that I think directly um, influence enrollment, one is that um, we are really trying to, um, de to develop and capitalize on a lot of different formats in the way that we offer courses. And 69% um, of our courses are online this fall. Um, that what, you know, um, it was interesting. I serve on this college board advisory panel and it's 12 um, community college presidents from around the country. And um, the, the chancellor of the Houston community college system was on the call in the middle of the summer. And he represents a, a system that has, you know, 350,000 students. So it's not a small, sample, it's the size of, you know, it's, it's big. Anyway, um, he said to us, he said, you know, one of the things, a lot of the literature is talking about how people are so anxious to be in person and back together. He said, but I can tell you from in Houston, we're not seeing that. People are not, that when they're paying for courses, they are not paying to go in person. So it was interesting because, you know, I think that we're hearing a lot of both nationally and locally, um, that, you know, that people are anxious to get back to, to, to in-person. And I think that's true for a swath of people, don't get me wrong, but I also think that he's seeing, as are we, that online continues to be um, a popular format. So we're doing online, we're doing synchronous online, which actually I think is gonna become the most, a really popular um, 
uh, silver lining to COVID where synchronous, they have some scheduled time with a, with a faculty, with a class and then a lot online. And I think it, what it does is it removes geography. So mm -hmm. people don't have to come to a class. They can, they can get that interaction um, right from wherever they are. We're also doing accelerated, we're doing flex, we're doing hybrid, and we're doing about 20% of our classes are in person. So um, I think that has, that has been, um, that combination has spoke to people. I also think, and this is where I wanna point you to is in the strategic plan, the number of pathways, credentials, short-term credentials, leading to certificates, leading to associate degrees, I think is really helpful because people can get, they can get something quickly. They can use that to get a different job, get a promotion, whatever. They can, it's part of a continuum. And that's why um, Janet's comment about the pathway to the other Vermont State Colleges is incredibly important because I think a, a large segment of our population in the future is gonna be around just-in-time education. They come, they take some courses, they go into the work, or they go in, they're already in the workforce, they're just gonna have a different job. They hit a plateau, they come back, but they have the courage because they keep seeing, they're seeing incremental progress. Mm -hmm. And so I do think um, you'll see that we, you know, we, what we've done with our credentialing is embedded everything within our associate degrees and then hopefully that's embedded within a bachelor's degree. So no one's taking wasted credits. It's all working. It's, it's just building that, that continuum. Um, and then the final thing I just wanna mention um, and just put the board on alert that um, we are um, going through our NETI accreditation process. We're in the final stages of, of preparing a draft that will be out for public comment soon. But in early March, we will be hosting a visiting team and my hope is that um, we, they'll be able to talk with a number of board members. Um, so um, stay tuned for that. But um, all, you know, all of, our, all of us um, within the Vermont State Colleges um, goes through an accreditation process every 10 years. And um, we are, I can't believe we were in 2012 and now it's 2000, I mean, 2022, but here we are again. And, um, we will want the board to be engaged a bit when the visiting team comes. So with that, I will stop and I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions for Joyce Judy? Go ahead, Janet. Um, uh, and I did not have a chance to read your package that you left us yesterday. Oh, Janet, so. I don't know why last night. If you had insomnia, <laughs> it would be pretty good. So, sorry. Um, just uh, off the top of your head, are there some dominant themes that you're seeing in um, certifications, like, is it all over the map? Are you seeing, you know, you know, what is the top two most popular? I just, I, it's just curious to me. Yeah, uh, you know, I, what um, people are interested in. Yeah, I would say, Janet, it's really a smattering. Um, you know, I can tell you the healthcare continues to be a, a big one. And we are, I think, as you know, a huge um, we have a wonderful and strong relationship and have for years with Vermont Technical College. And so the pathway, the allied health certificate into the um, nursing program at Vermont Tech is, is strong and, will, and continues to be strong. But then things like manufacturing, um, bookkeeping, um, you know, we've done a lot of um, partnering with um, different entities around like um, the boot camp around um, um, technology. Um, with an entity in, in Burlington. Um, we also have um, hooked up with Amazon around cloud computing and helping people um, get the skills they need to do jobs in working with in cloud computing or particularly in remote. And so I think that um, I would say that there's not one, it's really a smattering. It's always interesting because I, um, in addition to signing diplomas, I also sign um, we award certificates. And um, I've just got done signing the ones that, for people that finished in the summer. And, um, you know, we do a, from funeral directing to bookkeeping to allied health certificate to manufacturing. It's really across the board. Um, you know, and that represents the diversity of Vermont's workforce. So I don't have, I, I can, I don't have the numbers in terms of what's most popular, but 
just based on my anecdotal um, um, signing of certificates, it's pretty across the board. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll go to Jonathan Spiro at Castleton. Thank you, Lynn. I could give past reports for VTC if you want, or I just start with Castleton. Uh, it occurs to me that I have a bifurcated report for you because on the one hand, we have had an amazing opening to the semester uh, and morale in the Castleton community is sky high. Uh, and for a number of good reasons. First of all, we are teaching face-to-face, -face, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful thing, even with masks. Uh, secondly, while COVID remains in the forefront of our planning, the number of positive cases on our campus in a given week ranges from very low to non-existent. Mm -hmm. And yes, we are well aware that that could change any minute. Uh, third, enrollment is holding steady. This is partly due to the fact that out-of-state enrollment continues to go up at Castleton. 38% of our students are now from out-of-state, which is good news for us and great news for the state of Vermont because uh, out-of-staters not only contribute to our economy during the four years they are here at Castleton, but then, of course, they often choose to stay in Vermont, to contribute their expertise to the professional workforce, get married, have children, pay taxes, uh, and buy season tickets to our football games. In addition, we just welcome the largest group of incoming international students in our history. This is in the middle of a pandemic. It frankly took me by surprise. They hail from 20 different countries, and they have an immeasurably positive effect on our campus. We continue to receive unsolicited accolades. The most recent report from the US Department of Education shows that Castleton is number three in the nation for job placement by public school. Washington Monthly's annual college guide just ranked Castleton 10th in the nation for public liberal arts colleges. They also named Castleton a best bang for the buck college in the Northeast, which means that we, quote, help non-wealthy students obtain marketable degrees at affordable prices, unquote. Uh, similarly, the financial news site 24 seven Wall Street named Castleton the most affordable college with the best outcomes in Vermont. And I'll give you one more, Zipia. Zipia is a career resources website. They state, and I quote, students who go to Castleton, which has a job placement rate of 95%, are almost handed jobs just for having Castleton on their resume. So as a result of all this, school spirit is at a peak. The number of students who walk by wearing Castleton paraphernalia, hats, T-shirts, sweatshirts, sweatpants. It's astounding. I've never seen anything like that on any campus. Uh, we're witnessing a huge student attendance at on-campus events. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Our annual club, club fair was two weeks ago in the pavilion. And hundreds of students showed up to learn about our dozens and dozens of student-run on-campus clubs. And at homecoming this weekend, Despite a threat of thunderstorms, 4,000 people gathered for a ginormous tailgating party outside the stadium, after which some of them actually found their way inside the stadium for the game itself. Um, our fall athletic program is in full swing, not just football, soccer, rugby, volleyball, golf, cross country, field hockey. They're all participating face to face and having a lot of fun. It's just thrilling to be on a face-to-face -face campus again. Um, when I got to the office this morning, I looked out the window behind me and over there, the choir was singing on the steps of the Fine Arts Center. And down there, a group of art students was sitting on the grass, sketching, I guess. Um, 
Over there, the spirit band was practicing. I'm looking out my window now. I can see on the rail trail joggers and bicycle riders and dog walkers. Um, my friend Ethan from the grounds crew is mowing the lawn as he always does. Whenever I have a Zoom call, he appears right outside my window to mow the lawn. Um, and some guy on a unicycle just rode by, I think. Anyway, uh, morale is high. It's a great time to be at Castleton. Uh, why then did I say I have a bifurcated report? Because uh, the present is sunny, but it's my duty to report that um, uh, looking to the future, folks are understandably concerned about the merger. The community is afraid, uh, rightly or wrongly, that uh, much of what I described above, athletics, arts, on-campus activities, residence halls, pride in our campus uh, is going to somehow go away. Um, it's not a wholly irrational fear, by the way. Uh, we seem to be bombarded by external consultants who have never been on our thriving campus, yet erroneously preach that anything online is better than everything in person. Uh, Listen, I and we fully embrace technology and all of its amazing benefits, but the idea that there is no longer a place in Vermont for a beautiful, flourishing, residential, liberal arts college with compassionate faculty and staff who provide individualized mentoring, that's a false and kind of pernicious theory. And at Castleton, we prove it every day. I think, Lynn, I'll stop there before my self-righteousness really becomes obnoxious. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Jonathan Spiro about Castleton? Go ahead, Janet. Um, so uh, you're the latter part of your, so the first part, great. I happen to have had a couple family members at a soccer game the other week and they said it was wonderful. Um, to the latter part of your conversation, I think it's really important for people to understand and maybe you can provide suggestions to the trustees that, you know, whenever change is gonna happen, people put it in their own head what that change is gonna look like, right? And they either come up with a best case scenario or a worst case scenario. And certainly um, in conversations we were having as a board yesterday, and I realize some of the board members aren't here, you know, there is certainly no vision by the trustees to say the whole system's going online and get over it, right? That is not what anyone has said. Um, we know we have to do things differently um, and we don't all know yet what difference is gonna look like. Um, and yes, there will be change, but I think it's really important that you help us figure out how to make sure that that message doesn't become a, a one note sort of, uh, I don't know, individuals deciding what it is is going to happen um, before it's even stated something like that is going to occur. And I think yesterday with the trustees, there was certainly a, uh, a group that was passionate that there's clearly a place for the, maybe we call it the traditional on-campus experience and what it brings. Um, so I guess my, my request is looking for your help in um, how we uh, deal with the people that are fearful of something that they envision is going to happen when there's that has not been that that has not been stated. Thanks, Janet. Um, a few thoughts occurred to me. One is I've always preached to um, people above me in the hierarchy that. An on-campus, in-person visit with our community goes a long way. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm very pleased to see that there's going to be uh, a week-long listening tour this week. They're arduous. They're exhausting. Sometimes you uh, have to hear uh, some negative views. But um, when, when people in any of our communities realize that the people above them, from me, including me, are not some faceless ogre, but are human beings who are doing their best for the state of Vermont, that goes a long way toward alleviating 
anxiety, uh, and certainly alleviates hostility. Uh, similarly, I think that every consultant should be required to come visit our campuses before they render judgments on, on what they think is best for us. I mean, that just is common sense to me. Um, I think that um, um, I'll be curious to see the reaction for the rest of the day in my emails and phone calls to the new name. Um, I think that um, um, even if there's initial reticence or even hostility that might be mollified as we go forward by um, what they talked about, allowing some customization, some individualization, either, either for geography or for uh, programs. Um, so that's, that'll help. Um, if we can demonstrate that the merger is going to result in actual cost savings, um, that will certainly help. We're not there yet. Uh, we know that the individual presidents are gonna go away. That'll save some money, but if we could demonstrate more cost savings, that will help um, uh, make our case to the public. Um, that's all I got off the top of my head so far. Thanks for asking. Please, Alan, please. Um, not to take away from any of your accolades uh, that you listed on your national basis, do you think that Vermont's experience with COVID has, could have also contributed to some extent to the increase in uh, attendance or enrollment? Uh, I know that I suspect that our experience with COVID helped some of our institutions. You heard President Judy point out that community colleges nationwide are down 10 to 15 percent, and CCV is up, completely contradicting the national trend. That's an amazing stat, and it might have something to do with COVID. Uh, we're pretty certain that at Castleton, COVID hurt our attendance. Uh, okay. And so I said, uh, our attendance, our enrollment is holding steady. It's up slightly, but uh, to us, that's actually kind of miraculous because COVID really um, made a lot of people opt to, to opt out for a year or to go to fully online colleges. And we've managed to maintain that. So it's a great question, but I think the answer is it varies from institution to institution. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, who else do we have here? Um, anyone else have a question for Jonathan Spiro? Uh, uh, seeing none, I want to say thank you. And I'm glad that you've got lots of students who came back. I suspect there were some students who had pent up desires to return. And, and that may be one of the reasons why you're having so much success, they've come back. That's a great thing. I hope that would be true at all of our schools. And I do think that Vermont was perceived as being safe. And I think that that did have an impact on a variety of other institutions in the state. So I'm glad you have all those out of state students who've come here because their parents want them to be in a place where COVID is really well managed and low. So I, I do think I'm just doing this off the top of my head, but I think it probably did have an impact and I'm glad that we're, we're benefiting from it. Uh, the next one will be Nolan Atkins from NVU. Hi, Nolan. All right. Yeah, good morning, everyone, and thank you. Um, I'd like to start my NVU report just talking about uh, COVID since that is top of mind for many of us in our daily lives. Um, so certainly true here at NVU with our students, faculty and staff. Uh, just an update in terms of how NVU continues to safeguard our communities against the pandemic. Um, NVU continues its commitment to safety and safety has been first and foremost throughout the end pandemic for, for NVU. Uh, we uh, ensure safety. Uh, we are currently doing that through weekly testing available to all community members. Uh, we are offering single occupancy rooms for all students. Um, we have outdoor teaching opportunities uh, in tents on campus. Uh, like the rest of the uh, 
of VSCS residential schools, a vaccination requirement for any students who will be on campus at any time during the academic year. Uh, we have a masking requirement indoors for all uh, when in the presence of others and a full vaccination requirement for all visitors to our campuses who are age 12 or older. Currently, NVU has a 96% vaccination rate amongst the residential and commuter students attending classes on the two main campuses, and so we're very happy about that. In terms of campus life and athletics, uh, similar to what uh, Jonathan just reported, um, students, faculty, and staff are thrilled to be back on campus. Uh, campus life as we knew it uh, prior to the pandemic is back. Students are enjoying club fairs, campus music, theatrical traditions, face-to-face, -face, student government meetings, trips to popular destinations, such as uh, Boston and Burlington. Our athletic teams are practicing, they're competing, they're excited to be doing so uh, again in, in a face-to-face -face, uh, format on, on campus. Um, we're uh, pleased to have this component of student life back in action on our campuses. It's just, it's nice to see the vibrancy back for sure, as, as, as Jonathan just reported at Castleton. Over the past two weekends, uh, we've celebrated homecoming and family weekends, uh, first at Johnson, then at Linden. It was so wonderful to see students, families, and alumni engage in the many events and programs um, on our two campuses. On both campuses, we inducted alumni into Hall of Fame and Athletics Hall of, uh, the Athletics Hall of Fame. Uh, we gave alumni awards as well. Uh, we returned to outdoor concerts, ice cream socials, Hall of Fame inductions, and, and roll call awards to celebrate and recognize our faithful alum. Mm -hmm. um, on the Johnson campus, we officially opened the wellness suite with a ribbon cutting. Uh, the wellness suite renovation was made possible by a lead gift from local friends and supporters, Peter and Evelyn Foos. Uh, during uh, the event, Peter noted that, and this is a quote, we were happy to support this project because we believe in the power of higher education, especially for first-generation students attending a state university. And we are pleased to help NVU meet the goals of student athletes, as well as serve the greater NVU community. Through the generous generosity of 109 donors, we raised nearly $500,000 for this renovation which includes the renovation of rooms dedicated to stretching and core work and group exercise classes. Additionally, an underutilized racquetball court was converted to a strength and conditioning facility. The new spaces have been named in honor and memory of alums Peter Albright, class of 1980, and Gary Sudall, class of 1982. Um, alumni, student athletes, staff, and community members from 17 states gave gifts of all sizes. And the project also received a grant from the Green Mountain Fund and a donation of equipment from Concept2. So just a wonderful event um, during homecoming and family weekend. The highlight for me though, um, and for many of our recent graduates were the graduation processionals. So on both campuses, we, um, held uh, graduation processional events for the classes of 2020 and 2021. They were designed to be very similar to the actual commencement ceremony. Uh, and we had, uh, you know, roughly uh, 50 to 60 students come back and participate. It was very meaningful. It was very impactful. It was um, as impactful as if they were um, walking across the stage in a May commencement ceremony. Uh, we held dinner celebrations for the graduates and their families after the processionals. And again, it was just a, a wonderful moving experience for them. And so we're really, really grateful that, that we were able to do that for the students. On the academic side of the house, just a couple of initiatives that, that I'd like to update you all about that we are very excited about. The first is what uh, is called Semester Cinema. And so um, I'm hopeful that you saw the, the great publicity that we received around Semester Cinema, our partnership with Kingdom County Productions. So Jay Craven and, and Bess O'Brien. Uh, through this partnership, NVU students and college students from around the country will help produce a feature length film that uh, will be called Lost Nation. 
this experiential learning uh, program with has a 15 year history. It will be based on the Linden campus during the winter and spring of 2022, so next semester. Uh, the KCP NVU partnership will base classes and the production of Lost Nation both in Nantucket and on the Linden campus. Two NVU students will receive full scholarships to participate in this program, so we're very excited about that. Um, a couple of years ago, Austin Pellegrino, an NVU Linden alum who previously participated in the semester cinema as a student at Linden, said the program at the time was the most immersive and professional filmmaking experience of his career, which it was just an incredibly impactful experience for him. He has since co-founded a cinema production studio called Midnight Industry based in Bethlehem, New Hampshire. So this program is a great segue to um, an update on the NVU learning and working community vision and concept. And since the, so since the last Board of Trustees update given by President Collins, uh, we have made significant and very real progress in establishing the learning and working community vision. Um, a year ago, this significant and pivotal, pivotal refocus for NVU was a concept. Today, it is well on its way be, to becoming a reality. Uh, the learning and working community vision takes NVU's previous experiential and hands-on learning practices and makes a very deep commitment to embedding this hands-on learning within each and every degree pathway. Um, additionally, we will embed this learning within community organizations, businesses, nonprofits, and the creative economy. Mm -hmm. And by providing financial support, and this is critical and key to this, this vision, for these work experiences, often in the form of a paid internship, we are importantly reducing the cost of earning a college degree for our students. Yeah. So I'm pleased to share the early success of this vision. In fact, we have just released our first annual report on the project, which you have in your NVU packets shared at the board meeting yesterday. Mm -hmm. This past summer, NVU awarded financial support to 27 students who engaged in summer internships. The total support was about $50,000 for students, ranging from a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars. So this is truly impactful. Uh, we are able to do this with the generous support of a donor who gifted us $3.5 million to help us actualize this concept. And as we are sharing now, we're in a position to make these student awards. We will be able to do this on an ongoing basis. We have um, our next round of awards will be for fall internships and we will continue to do this on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited about that. In June, we hired a coordinator to help us realize and actualize the vision uh, Vin Favoroso was hired as NVU's first partner engagement and workforce development coordinator. He's been hard at work doing outreach with our communities to develop partnerships with nonprofits and businesses and others. And in this position, Vin will support both employers and students, helping to create formal partnerships and student pathways in support of the learning and working community vision over a three year period. Again, this position and this work is supported by uh, the generous $3.5 million gift that we received to actualize the vision. Uh, just a couple other uh, highlights to wrap up um, this piece. Part of the learning working community vision and concept is to focus on career readiness. Uh, this fall, we will launch a career readiness pilot program to ensure that all NVU graduates graduate from NVU uh, career ready. Uh, we are defining this um, based on the career readiness competencies developed by the National Association of Colleges and Employers, or NACE. Our program will provide information and activities to help students recognize value and articulate the essential skills that they are learning in and out of the classroom. With the help of faculty, each year students will take part in several modules that will help them learn about themselves in the world of work and direction and gain an insider's view of where their interests lie, build their brand, set and reach their goals. 
Our approach will support um, our students as they follow their career path in the future. We're, we're piloting this program this semester, again, though, with the ultimate goal that every student who graduates from NVU attains these competencies and we then essentially certify them as career ready. So the last uh, update that I'd like to share relative to the learning working community vision and to wrap up my report is uh, it concerns a recent partnership that our outdoor education and leadership and tourism program has developed. Um, they have developed a cooperative partnership with the Kingdom East School District, which includes schools in Burke, Newark, Sutton, and additionally in, in Concord. Uh, the cooperative arrangement is designed on a, con or to continue on every semester, giving students in the program an opportunity to participate on an ongoing basis. And I'll explain what the, the, the partnership is about in a second. Um, the, the sites, in this case, the schools, actually have obtained funding to pay students who will enroll in a three credit internship course to engage in this opportunity. Additionally, the students can apply for stipend support through this learning working community internship support that I just discussed. This will all obviously help offset their tuition expense. Um, through the program, what the students will actually be doing is they will be designing and developing the recreational offerings for the schools and then lead the school students in the recreational activities. So, this is just a wonderful example of realizing this vision. Um, it's exactly what we're working toward. The cooperative uh, program gives NVU students an in-depth on the ground experience that puts their degree program to work. It provides value to the greater community and um, the, in the region that uh, NVU resides in. Uh, it actually involves a local institution in developing a program that suits their needs. And it provides NVU students with an experience that helps to ensure that they graduate career ready, uh, gives them an example of what they can do with their degree. And finally, and most importantly, it reduces the cost of earning their degree. Uh, six students are taking part in this program this semester and it will continue on an ongoing basis. So we're really excited to see this as, as a pilot program uh, that is completely consistent with, with this vision that uh, we're actualizing it in view. And I will stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Nolan Atkins about the Northern Vermont University experience in their report? Janet. Yeah, um, so I did read your folder, sorry to the rest of them. Um, and I really did um, your, the, uh, that community report you put together was uh, very informational and um, very inspiring. So I think it's a really great thing that you guys are doing and that's been funded. And um, I, think it, I think it helps shape the future for what education kind of can look like. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for the feedback. Uh, I do have a question. I believe, Nolan, you were involved with some people from the Ski Areas Association to trying to set up internships and other similar kinds of programs for the ski areas with your students. Um, we have a program similar to that at Castleton with Killington. Um, does that have any legs or is that something that we're still working on? Yeah, two comments there. Uh, First, our, our current program, our current uh, mountain recreation management program does have uh, relationships with ski areas, not only within the state, but actually across the country. But more specifically, um, additional conversations with the Vermont Ski Area Association are ongoing. We're, we're at the point where we're waiting for them to uh, uh, identify individuals on the board who are able and willing to engage in the conversation and then we'll actually meet. So that's where it's at. It's actually with them to identify board members to work with us to engage in the conversation and to move the, the conversation forward. Yes, thank you. Um, any other questions? 
Any questions, concerns? Okay, well, thank you very much, Nolan. Good luck with those exciting sounding programs. Uh, now we have Pat Moulton from Vermont Tech. Thank you very much, Chair Dickinson, and thank you all. I will try to go through this quickly. I know we're running out of time, but um, we did share packets with you all yesterday. There's a lot of really great information in there. Please take a look when you have a chance, uh, including a great impact report from our Continuing Ed and Workforce Development Division that I think you'll find fascinating. Uh, but we are back here in full swing here at Vermont Tech. We have over 250 students in our residence halls between Randolph Center and Williston. Fewer than we would like, but it's a lot more than last year. All but one room is full at our res hall in Williston. We have space here in Randolph Center, but we've been fortunate enough to rent rooms to Vermont Law School students who are staying with us this semester and some traveling nurses who are working at Central Vermont Medical Center. So that's great news. Uh, we're back in our labs as usual and students are very pleased and faculty are very pleased. Happy to say that our first year class is up 15% over last fall. So we've recovered our COVID slip from last fall, which is really great news. Uh, we're also seeing fewer withdrawals this year than last year, which is really great news. Our overall enrollment is up about 1%. Uh, that's due to the smaller first year class we had last year that is gonna be following us through in our subsequent years. Um, we are seeing students following our proto COVID protocols very well. Uh, we did have a little computer glitch with students reporting their vaccine status, which we're trying to track down, but we have approximately 80% vaccination rate of those who have reported. We do have a 4% uh, requested and granted exemption, either medical or religious exemptions. We're looking into weekly testing for our unvaccinated students. We're currently testing our athletes weekly. Um, also, we don't have our CRF or ARPA funds that we had last year, but there are funds set aside at the chancellor's office for testing and other needs. My sincere thanks to Sharon Scott for making that happen. Uh, we've got our homecoming and family weekend planned for this weekend. We've got a lot of fun activities planned. We too will be recognizing our 20 and 21 graduates at this event. We are expecting lower attendance than usual, primarily due to COVID and especially with our older 50 or 45 uh, year reunion classes, but we are gonna put on a good event for those who are attending. Our advanced manufacturing lab construction is almost complete, but we too are a victim of supply chain issues on electrical equipment. So we've got all kinds of cool stuff in there and no electricity to power it at the moment, uh, but that hopefully will be solved soon. Uh, much of the larger pieces of our additive manufacturing equipment are in and our way cool new whiz-bang five-axis CN machine are in. I don't know if many of you be, get excited about five-axis CNC machines, but I, I'm very excited about it. Um, the place looks great. The new fire suppression system is in and we're hoping for a ribbon cutting in early 22 when all the equipment is in and students have been able to get in and do their work and can demonstrate the amazing capabilities of that lab. And I just wanna give a huge shout out, a shout out to Barry Hulse, who is our director, executive director of the Vermont Manufacturing Collaborative, which is what birthed this advanced manufacturing lab baby, if you will. Barry has been a one man show doing amazing work and keeping us moving ahead on our DOD deliverables, as well as getting the lab set up. In fact, I really wanna give kudos to the entire Vermont Tech team. I mean, our faculty who worked incredibly hard this summer on optimization and transformation work and are still going full steam on that work, including the great work that Trustee Kluver uh, pointed out on our computing and engineering faculty providing all the thousand level courses this year in a high flex format, making it far more accessible. I also wanna thank the financial aid and registrar staff who got an incoming class admitted and handed out more than $3 million in scholarships in a hurry after July 1, the effective date of the scholarship money that the legislature generously provided us. Keep in mind that required that they had to go back and rework every single financial aid package that had already been developed over the last several months. So it's a lot of work on top of everything else they are doing with her funding and of course transformation. That we've seen a big jump in enrollment in our uh, online bachelor in nursing's program as a result of those scholarships and, and our other health careers, which is fantastic. I also want to recognize our athletic staff getting our sports teams fully populated and up and running after a year and meeting COVID requirements. 
our student affairs staff, which is getting vaccination information, making sure students know and how to follow protocols and dealing when they don't, as well as dealing with 30 plus, plus non-VTC students in our res halls, getting them settled um, and dealing with the possibles that we have within our student, the possible positives within our student body and more. Uh, we have had a fair number of new staff in our student affairs uh, office. So this is, they're doing great work with amazing turnover. Same with our Center for Academic Success and our marketing and admissions team doing incredible work to get that 15% class in for this fall. Keep in mind, admission staffs have not been able to travel to college fairs or high schools or any of that normal recruitment activity, but still came in with a bigger class. And our marketing staff um, who have continued to do amazing work without their fearless leader, Amanda Chalk, our director of marketing, uh, resigned for a new opportunity this year. But um, they're continuing to crank out great social media graphics, keep our website up to date. And I can't say enough for the contractors we've brought in to work with our marketing staff. They've been doing excellent work. Our facilities team is short staffed and, and few to no student hires this summer due to no students being on campus. Yet the campus looks great. Maintenance is happening. Our public safety officers are doing amazing work with our students, our contractors keeping them uh, on task, as well as we had to deal with a hostile intruder, a real live one on our campus in May. Our HR team, the whopping two of them, keep addressing the unique challenges of, of staffing and recruitment, particularly in this labor force. Our continuing ed and workforce development team who literally daily receive cries of help from employers across Vermont in every sector seeking stat talent and who are again administering the Workforce 2.0 grants. And of course, Michelle Graham, my assistant, who amazes me her ability to step in whenever, wherever is needed and continue to do amazing work. I can't say enough about this team. They amaze me and they make me so proud every day. They are gems every one of them. On the not so rosy side, staffing is clearly an issue. Our health services coordinator part-time retired and finding a part-time RN to fill that position is the needle in the haystack. We're soon posting for a full-time, actually we have folks posted for a full-time health services coordinator, given that we don't have a full-time COVID coordinator and we know COVID isn't going away anytime soon. We also are required to do our own contact tracing, all of us this year again. Um, and that's another reason we need a full-time coordinator. We are short staffed in our student affairs office, but they're doing great wet work. They can't do it, do it all. We've got short staffing in almost every sector. Sedexo, um, who normally has a staff of 21, has seven this year um, and are hiring student hires. They cannot find people to hire. We've lost our Associate Dean of Development, our Director of Marketing, and half of our library staff. Um, folks are leaving due to opportunities elsewhere we can't match, and a lot due to the uncertainty of transformation. Some of these positions are filling relatively either, others easy, others are not. Morale is struggling. Like Jonathan, folks are thrilled to have students back on campus, but everybody is COVID burnt out, not just weary, burnt out. They've all been dealing with budget shortfalls here at Vermont Tech for over a decade now. Their plates are loaded up because of new and exciting opportunities, which is great, but also a lot of trans transformation work, which is new. Yeah. Uh, patience can be thin and tensions can be high. Uh, we are doing some employee appreciation work next month. We'll do our annual employee recognition dinner, but you should know there's limited bandwidth left for a lot of new things without something else coming off the list. Having said all of that, the team is doing amazing work. COVID won't be with us forever. We will emerge a stronger institution as one. I also wanna thank Sophie and the whole entire team at the chancellor's office who are right there with us struggling through this. No, they're not experiencing camping, campus issues, but they've got a whole ton of other issues on their plate. This is hard work we're doing, but it's being done by people who are committed to ensuring the tremendous value the VSC in institutions bring to the state of Vermont. I believe will be stronger, better, and even more effective as Vermont State University than we are now. And I can't wait to see what that looks like. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Pat, that was a heartfelt presentation and I think we all feel your pain. 
Well, I, I don't want to paint a picture that all is lost. It's, it's, we've got exciting and wonderful things happening every day, but it is a challenge some days. And the workforce challenge is not unique to everybody else. It's happening to us too. Yeah, yeah, this is true. Janet. A yeah, quick question. Is your nursing program full? Yes, I'm happy to say every site is maxed out this year. Usually we have a few seats left in either Bennington or Brattleboro. That's not the case this year. And, I, and a lot of that's due to the critical occupation scholarships mm -hmm. and the opportunities for folks to come, you know, like I said, in the BSN program, where students can take that bachelor's in nursing completely online. That's, that's the enrollments jumped a lot there, which has been, been fantastic. Yeah. I think that, and you know what Joyce was mentioning, I think those are great examples of when you make things affordable, they will come. Um, Amen. We should leverage those with the people who give us money. Yeah, I, I absolutely. And you know, I, and like Joyce spoke about, you know, the demand is everywhere. I mean, their manufacturers are calling yeah, us well, every day. Get me, a fry, get me a fry too, please. Are calling uh, healthcare, are, you, are Oops, sorry. Healthcare institutions are calling us. I mean, service, um, you name it. They're calling us to say, what can you do? And they're looking for short, medium, and long-term answers. We bring the medium and long-term, not so much on the short-term, where you truly have to educate students to take on some of these positions. So, Anyone else have any comments or questions for Pat regarding Vermont Tech? I thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> I thank all of you for your enthusiasm. I, I, I'm, under no, uh, I'm under no illusions that what you're doing is easy. This is hard work and I, I think we all owe you a debt of gratitude uh, as well as uh, the chancellor and the people in her office. I know that they're working very hard to help you. And you know we know that the, um, some of the things the legislature did and some of the federal money has made a major difference that the governor's work on the COVID has helped. And I uh, really want to thank all of you. Any other questions or any comments for the, the presidents? Okay, not seeing any more of that. We do have additional business. I don't see any other additional business. Does anyone want to bring something up that would be important? Or uh, important. We're all important, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And I'd echo your, your um, compliments to the presidents. This is incredible work. Thank you. Janet, you want something to say? Sorry, um, just super quick, um, because they weren't all with us. You know, the, the, the people who attended yesterday's trustees meeting, our final moments of executive session included a discussion about how great it was that Sophie and Yasmin and, and I, I'll never get everybody sharing, you know, not all the names, but all of you have leaned in so hard to this and how hard you have all worked and how much we appreciate it. I think Bill actually had the best speech, but I can't remember everything he said. Um, but I think we all, uh, in speaking, I'll speak for the rest of the group. Thank you. We know what a heavy lift, a heavy, heavy lift it's been. And um, we really appreciate what you've done. Bill, do you remember what you said? <laughs> I think Janet has captured it. Uh, I, I think there's deep appreciation. I'll, I'll add one other thing I was thinking. In listening, in listening to the program aspects uh, across the different parts of uh, our system, I. Uh, both as a legislator and as just a Vermonter, I, I am once again, truly, it, it's so important for Vermont to understand how essential the work is that is going on in training Vermonters to fill the important roles in healthcare, in, in uh, schools, in manufacturing. It's like the Vermont State College system is an essential part of the infrastructure of Vermont. And anyone listening, it's it's perfectly obvious how important it is for us to continue to move forward and, and succeed. So again, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well, we now have a public comment period. Um, is Jen, 
Corey are available to say if there's anyone who signed up for the uh, public comment. Uh, yes, Chair Dickinson, we do have one um, person who has signed up to make public comment, and that is Beth Walsh. Beth, we have unmuted you if you would like to make your public comment. Is Beth there? There. Beth, are you, you can unmute yourself. That would be helpful. Uh, we've given you the option to unmute yourself, Beth. Um, Doesn't look like I've got it. Oh, there you go. Oh, Here you go. oh good. Great. Good, because I couldn't see anything that said unmute. So thank you for giving me time to say a few words. Um, I loved listening to the, the, the meeting, but especially the presidential reports. Uh, I think Pat Moulton hit a lot of nails right on the head. We are almost all of us are thrilled to be back on campus. We're still very worried about um, what's what it's going to look like going forward, but we missed our students when we were working from home. Um, uh, one thing I've noticed is that we continue to see faculty and staff give their notices um, on all of our campuses and morale is not good. It is not sky high. It is it is crashing. Um, staff are overworked. And like others have said, we have the additional tasks of being on these transformation committees. It's exciting work, but all of us are overworked because of the positions that haven't been filled. Uh, we love our students and our colleagues and our institutions, and we're struggling to stay optimistic. Um, I can only hope that some of that budget surplus, and I understand there's plenty of places to spend it, but we have to fill positions and keep the staff that we have um, because recruiting staff at this point has been very difficult. I talked to so many people who are trying to hire staff and they're losing their first choices because of the salaries that we are offering. It's not enough and we really have to really, it's hard, it's hard. We don't have enough money to do it the way we need to do it, but we're losing people. Um, I do also want to share with you that about 43% of our members voted on whether to support mandating vaccines for staff and um, so that's about 80 votes, 67 said yes, 13 said no. So 84% of our staff say, yes, we need to mandate vaccinations. And we look forward to, um, to negotiating how a vaccine mandate will be put in place and enforced. Beth, can I ask you one Enforcing question? mask mandates and- well, yeah. um, Why don't you continue? <clears throat> enforcing mask mandates and vaccination requirements for visitors. Um, it seems to be different on different campuses. We feel that it should be the same. All of our members should feel safe on their campus. Mm -hmm. And when we have different policies on each campus, it, it doesn't work out that way. Um, so if anybody has any questions for me, I'm happy to answer. Um, I love my work. I love both my jobs. I love my career services job and I love my union job. Um, there's not enough time to do both of them uh, really well. So I do my best and hopefully that's gonna be good enough to get us through. Yeah, thank you, Beth. One question I wanna just clarify. You said 43% of the people who you surveyed in the, in the faculty. 43% 40, of our members voted. 43%. So we had 80 votes. Okay. Okay. And that's from a count back in March. So I'm sure it's probably more than 43% because so many people have left. Um, right. But 84% voted yes, we need to mandate vaccinations for staff. And we understand that the Biden um, policy is probably gonna cover us, mm -hmm. but I just wanted you to know that we are, we're in it. We are all about keeping our communities safe. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So you did a survey and came out with a good result that shows clearly people want, mostly want this. Yes. And the mask mandate, there is no voter survey on that. No, no. Um, but, but from what we understand on each of our campuses, there's, there are campuses that are doing a really great job enforcing it, campuses that are struggling to enforce it. Um, some mixed messaging going out, things like that. 
And we have always been adamant that this needs to be a common policies and, and common commitment to keeping our campuses safe. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. So you're looking at 80% of the people who actually answered the survey were for the VAX mandate. And I, you know, I, I think that what I hear from many, many people in many, many fields, not just in our colleges, but that the employment situation is extremely difficult. People are leaving, people have retired, people have moved away. Mm -hmm. People just didn't go back to work. And it is really hard to replace them. I mean, what Pat described is a very real phenomenon across the board for everyone, which is why they want so badly for us to have people who can go and work, come out of our schools and work for them. Yeah. Right. So anyone else have any more questions? Any discussion? Um, Lynn, I just wanted to add, um, we have been surveying our um, faculty and staff about vaccination status, and right now uh, we have just under 70% have responded, and throughout the survey, we've been at around 97, 98% are fully, fully vaccinated, so right now it's 97%. We have been encouraging employees to respond just so we would have a sense for um, the, the level of vaccination. Um, as Beth mentioned, we are keeping an eye on what's happening at the federal level. So although um, President Biden's um, mandate uh, through OSHA applies to private employers because the state of Vermont um, has an OSHA approved state plan through VOSHA, um, there is, we do expect that public sector employees in Vermont will also be covered by that. But of course, we're still waiting like everyone else on what OSHA the emergency temporary rule, whatever it is they're coming out with, we've got to see what it looks like, but we are following that pretty closely and keeping an eye on it and being prepared in the event that that's um, what we have to do. We just don't want to rush to do something and then find out the federal rules different. So we're just, you know, we're expecting that to come down at any moment and we're preparing for it. Thank you. That's a good point. Yes, Bill. Can, can I just say in listening both to what uh, everyone has said earlier and what Beth has just said, it, it clearly speaks to the opportunity that is here. Uh, everyone is looking for workers, trained, skilled workers, and that is the name of our game. And so the, the, in the midst of all these challenges, and they are real uh, for our own system, uh, that our system is the answer to so many of the challenges that uh, others are having throughout the state in all the different work sectors of employment. So let's not, that's, we just need to hold that foremost as we move forward. Well said, thank you. Anyone else? Not seeing anyone else, I'd entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved by Jim Maslin, seconded by Bill Lippert. Any discussion? I wanna thank everyone once again for spending so much time and energy trying to help make this, this process work and make it successful for our students and for everyone involved for Vermonters. Um, all those in favor of adjournment, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Thank you very much. We'll see you in probably October thank or you. this week. Oh, okay. I went in on Wednesday, Wednesday at 6 30. Yes, <laughs> next Wednesday, a week on Wednesday. Can we ask for the, the tour information to be resent, the times and places? To everyone or just to you? Or what, what are you looking for the town I, hall? I, I would like meeting? to see it. <laughs> I, <laughs> I just want to be clear. a lot of stuff and I don't have it in hand. <laughs> I like that. Do you want the town hall meeting information and the listening session? information bill everything the town hall meetings i will do that thank you i'd I, like it as well I think okay send it to all the trustees everybody i appreciate that thank you i'll see you guys. thank you bye